A new warning tonight about the scope of a massive cyber attack. Uh, already believed to be the largest cyber attack on our government. America under virtual invasion. That's what Senator Dick Durbin is calling a massive Russian cyber attack on U.S. government agencies. Those news stories were from December 2020, where the solar wind supply chain attack provided hackers with access to as many as 18,000 government entities, Fortune 500 companies, and more than 100 companies were exposed to the breach. Now, the average cost of the impacted companies by solar wind breach was amounted to be an average of about $12 million. Yes, so the companies affected $12 million. Wow. I said December. 2020 is when the solar wind hack happened. May 2021, President Biden issued an executive order basically calling out that they want to strengthen the cybersecurity network capability of the administration. So it got that bad that even the US government had to come out and say, just send your cash. We need to spend money and basically some brain power on how do we strengthen our network from for cybersecurity attacks. Now, solar winds was just the beginning of the bonfire, I guess. The solar winds also set the stage for other attacks that followed suit, like there was log4j that happened. The log4j vulnerability is the most serious vulnerability that I've seen in my decades long yeah. career. Then there was the Okta breach that happened. One of the largest identity provider for a lot of companies around the world. They were also breached through a customer call center. So to put it in context, as you know, Okta is the trusted identity provider for over 15,000 companies. And so anytime something like this happens, it's a big deal. Now I can share many more incidents around this one chain of horrible security incidents that happened that affected a lot of companies, cost them a lot of money. And that is supply chain. See what I did there? One chain, supply chain. That was funny for me. Now, in this video, we'll talk about three reasons why the digital supply chain is broken. I think most companies have a supply chain and not even realize it. You know, for example, where you get your uh, word processing software, where you get your software to do uh, accounting and bookkeeping and things like that. All of that is part of your digital supply chain. So I think people are familiar with the term supply chain, but not so much with when you look at their digital supply chain. If you go to a website and buy or download a piece of software, that is now part of your digital supply chain. I would be willing to bet 99.9% .9 of companies have no idea what their full supply chain is, right? So there's uh, the third party open source applications that you use. There's uh, like, what are you using for continuous integration and continuous deployment? You've got like the cloud you're deploying on or your infrastructure. Uh, if you have like a, like a data center or something like that, uh, you probably use a bunch of SaaS applications. Um, I don't know, probably a hundred other things. Oh, you're also trusting the hardware, right? Like your developer's hardware, their phones, if it's BYOD. From your developer's laptops to your code repository, whether that is, uh, I'm not gonna name the vendors, but there's tons of vendors. Yeah. Um, your build systems, your custom build scripts, your testing technology, all the way deployed to production. It sounds pretty obvious when you hear everyone talk about, yeah, digital transformation this, we did this, we did that. If you haven't seen the video about digital transformation and its impact on cybersecurity, I'll probably leave a link somewhere there so you can check that video out. But I just wanna say that a lot of things have been added into our supply chain. It's very obvious. What this meant is, in fact, it's gone to a point where now there is an annual conference for supply chain security. Who would have thought there would be a whole conference dedicated for supply chain security. It is not a buzzword, people. Now, listening to all these fine folks, we can understand that the attack surface has become really wide. Basically, someone buying an online fax machine or whatever we're doing online these days is basically impacting us from a supply chain perspective. And most of these companies that are probably having a presence online or a customer online are being impacted by it. Well, which company these days is not online? Thank you, Pandemic, for introducing a lot of the unknowns in the digital supply chain, which has broken it completely. Let's get into the first reason why the digital supply chain is broken because of the open source dependencies. Yes, most of the developers that you have in your organization that are writing code and creating all these amazing libraries for costing you billions of dollars is most likely using some kind of an open source dependency. So when you take a second to look at the hierarchy of open source projects, I'm not just talking about like the the new stuff coming out. This has been the case for, for decades. If you take an open source project on GitHub, that open source project usually has a bunch of open source dependencies. And those open source dependencies usually have dependencies, and those dependencies usually have dependencies. And so you end up with a massive tree of maintainers that all can ultimately end up running code on this one open source project that you're running. Uh, I think right now the average uh, native application has about 70% adoption of uh, open source, and according to Gartner, in the next couple of years, it's gonna get up to 90%. So open source is a big uh, vector, and of course, third party. You used open source code in my billion dollar prototype? 
Jesus, Eric. You shouldn't be surprised by the last clip that we showed where someone was using this in their billion dollar prototype or thousand dollars of prototype, especially when they were found out that, hey, we are being affected by Log 4 j because of an open source library which we've been using. Ah! If you are someone who's probably looking at this and going, this is pretty bad. This is the worst. Yeah, yes and no, but there are ways to manage it, but we'll get into that in another video. Now, if you're a company filled with developers writing code, putting it from development all the way to production, now you understand that there's open source dependency risk you have opened up to. But one more thing you probably want to understand is the deployment method that you use to go from, say, development into production causes a lot of supply chains fall. Like, I'm talking about things like your CI CD pipeline that's used to push code from one place in development onto the production. I'm also talking about third party vendors that you may be using for integration or maybe SaaS applications that are using to monitor and perform certain activities as well, they all are exposing you to more open source risk. From my perspective, I think it's a very much a focus on sort of the CI CD pipelines that we have, right? So going from committing code to version control all the way to the, you know, integration tools, things like Circle CI and BuildKite and all that sort of stuff. And then to the continuous deployment aspects, your things like Terraform or any sort of Kubernetes operators or things like this, right? That's really what supply chain looks like to me. But you have the application uh, supply chain, right? Where you need to be aware of the dependencies that are in your application. But, you know, outside of just that and all of the transitive risks that you get there, you know, it's also all of the things that, you know, going back to cloud and, you know, your IAM, it's, you know, about all the things that are plugging in there. And so, you know, in all of the context, all of the backing that, uh, all the SaaS companies that are plugged into, you know, let's take Okta, for instance, right? Like um, something like that, you know, where they are the core of how you're provisioning access to your different resources. And so I think supply chain sprawl doesn't just uh, start and end at the application. I think all of the uh, intermediate parties that we are plugging in. Now, over the last two years, supply chain has clearly proven to be having a lot of importance in leaderships. It has gotten to a point. Remember, I mentioned the annual security conference and Joe Biden, uh, not Joe Biden and President Biden providing a executive order to improve the overall security posture. So it is no longer a buzzword. Now, the second reason why the supply chain is broken is because thank you, pandemic. Yes, pandemic was one of the reasons why there was an acceleration of a lot of supply chain things being added because last minute, Everyone has decided, hey, let's all bunker down and we, no one's going into the office. No one's driving out anymore from their houses. And this required a lot of new software and new supply chain things to be introduced in, into your workplace, into your daily lives. The first is this whole idea of digital transformation. Uh, you know, and, and COVID did accelerate that. For a lot of organizations that I talked to, they were on a digital transformation path. And I would say on average, it's been accelerated by anywhere from three to five years. That acceleration is creating a lot more use of uh, agile methodology, of rapid development, and, and, and of course, use of cloud. And all of these factors introduce a greater need for an accelerated supply chain and ultimately uh, introduce some of the risks that we're starting to see in the last two years. We felt a huge explosion in the amount of third parties that organizations are bringing on, um, pro supply pro like providers that they're installing locally. And I think the problem just became much more uh, large scale. So if in the past you could handle it manually, like you could say, okay, I'm bringing on this vendor, let's test it deep. Yeah. Now, now you have to move in the pace of the business. You have to automate those stuff, even from testing the, from uh, security scanning to API security to all, all aspects of that third party coming on. No, I'm not going to go into too much detail of why and how that why. I mean, people have basically overheard pandemic and what it has done. So I'm not going to go into it. Now, the third reason why this is also a problem is because the supply chain has components which have not yet been identified. Now, we were at a cybersecurity conference, which is probably RSA, which is one of the biggest conferences for 2022. And one of the themes over there was that people are identifying easier paths to crack into an organization. They're not using the hard to get using name password. Let's just be honest. If you're having a really hard password, 2FA, everything basically hard bolted, there is very little possibility for someone to go out and basically take over your account unless you really make a silly mistake. So what adversaries have started doing is they've gotten a bit more smarter. They're finding other ways to get into the organization, which is probably a lot more easier and doesn't get a lot of attention. I'm talking about the API security space. I'm not going to go into the SaaS security space. I think people kind of understand that and they, they 
else products in the SSPM space as well. So APIs or application programming interface as the purists would like me to call it. Now, this is probably one of the most underestimated spaces where a lot of attention has started starting uh, suddenly coming in because thanks to all the automation, everything that you're seeing around you, whether it's integrating into your cloud service provider, integrating into a third party, your cloud provider themselves asking you to automate doing DevOps. There's a lot of automation happening, whether it's through CLI or command line interface or through APIs provided by a cloud service provider. APIs are everywhere. And the problem is, because you're getting your information about APIs from say, vendors like cloud service providers, they probably give you the Kool-Aid that, hey, if you have something like a WAF or web application firewall or an API gateway, your API security is covered. They could not be more wrong. You're wrong. APIs are, they're just, people consider them there and they're just part of the, the, the works. Um, but one thing that needs to be looked at and understood is that as we bring in different components from the supply chain and start connecting them, all of those connecting points are are APIs, mm -hmm. right? And so the whole world's switching over to APIs. Software consume the world, but APIs are consuming software. And, and what that means is that we need to have better security around our APIs. Uh, and right now, the consumption of APIs is far outpacing what we're doing from a security standpoint. Okay, okay, so there's clearly some misinformation about the API security space, but why is, is it such a big thing? Because isn't just, just text going from one direction to the other direction? I send some text and I get some text back. Actually, it is a problem if the text you're getting back is your entire customer's credit card database, right? No, God, please, no! API gateways, right? They're, they're meant for, uh, WAFs in particular are, are really looking at web security. They don't really understand APIs. APIs are a different breed, a, a different layer, if you will, of, of how applications work. Uh, and so WAFs work on signatures. They may pull in, uh, you know, live signature updates, but they still don't understand the application and how the APIs themselves are working. Uh, they don't know if something is properly authorizing versus authenticating uh, to the degree that we need. API gateways, does do they do authentication authorization, but they, uh, they don't, again, understand the business logic of the of those APIs. They're really meant for management. Right. So they're not getting the deep enough level of API security that's needed to, to really stop the biggest vulnerabilities that we're seeing with APIs. He used to think, okay, I'll secure my code, but I won't necessarily have to secure the API. This is where it, it kind of drift off because that code can be a Bash script and a Python script and a Java script and a Java and a, tons of apps you might have in your environment. Now, everything that I've spoken to you about API security is quite terrifying. I'll give you that much, but you also have to understand adversaries are really getting smart. So not just focusing on things which are probably not being paid more, more attention to like your SaaS services or your APS services, but they're also finding out that, hey, we no longer need to just claim that I can deface your website. I can also weaponize some of the components that I have access to. Like for example, ransomware is a great one. Uh, crypto mining attacks is also a big one where people are basically taking over accounts of organizations and costing them a lot of money. Maybe one strategic shift is the rise in ransomware where um, previously, like how are you going to monetize attacking a company? It's like, well, you steal some of their IP or source code, you blackmail them and it's, not obvious how to profit from your malicious activity, but now it's very clear. You could be like, oh, we can do cryptocurrency miners, we could do uh, ransomware. And I think the sort of um, like commodification of how you get economic value from attacking a system, like that's changed. Yes. And I think that's made other things maybe more prevalent as well. Now, clearly you're wondering if adversaries are holding companies at ransom, shouldn't the focus be on third party risk have been there for a while? It has been there for a while. Businesses and leaders have been focusing on third party and keeping a close eye on third party for a long time, at least based on the reports that we've read and the conversations we've had, but there's still a lot of work to be done in this space. You may be wondering, Ashish, you gave us so many problems in supply chain. What about the solution? Why focusing on the problems only? So <laughs> stay tuned for that. This was getting a really long video, so I had to kind of cut it up. The solution is going to be in the second part of the video. Make sure you follow and subscribe on to the socials on LinkedIn, YouTube, so at least you're aware when the new video comes out on the solution for supply chain, because clearly we just can't talk about problems. We have to talk about solutions as well. But if there is a risk that I have missed or another reason why we're breaking the digital supply chain, feel free to drop that as a comment. If you really like the video as well, feel free to drop it a like or share it with your friends who probably are trying to understand much more about the digital supply chain space. That's pretty much what I had for this video and I will see you in the next video. Peace.